farm meals mentioned in Ypsilanti Farm Diaries in partnership with the culinary historians of Ann Arbor. Our speaker today, I'm very uh, happy to introduce. Laura Bean is a graduate of the University of Michigan and Eastern Michigan University. Laura is the author of The Hidden History of Ypsilanti. This book will be available for browsing on the refreshment table. And one of the best titles, perhaps ever, Tales from the Ypsilanti Archives, Tripe Mongers, Parker's Hair Balsam, The Underwear Club, and more. Yeah, that's the Ipsy we know and love. <laughs> she also contributes local history articles to the Ypsilanti Courier, the Ypsilanti Citizen, uh, the IpsyNews.com, Ann Arbor Observer, and the Ann Arbor Chronicle. She lives in Ypsilanti with her husband. Please help me welcome Laura Bean this afternoon. Thank you. I'm very pleased and honored to be here and speak with you today about foodways from our own area, from local farms. We're going to take a look at some local diaries that are held at the Ypsilanti Historical Archives, four, from four writers in particular. Three of them are mentioned here. One was a farmer, farmeress. One was a, po a poet and writer, and one was a schoolgirl. And the first question we should ask is, how good is a diary as a primary source for learning about food ways? And if you think about it, I keep a diary. I also have coffee every day, but I, I do not note. I had coffee this morning, <laughs> coffee this morning, coffee this morning, coffee this morning. So you could, there, there might be, um, it might not be representative of the actual diet of these people. But on the other hand, everyone we're going to discuss today was a farmer and worked intimately with food, creating food, planting all the time. And that is reflected in what they wrote in their diaries. So recognizing the limits of the primary source document, we can still glean useful information about the food ways of these people. Let's start by thinking about the context of their lives. Everyone we're going to discuss lived on a farm. Three of them lived in Superior Township, just north of Ypsilanti Township, and one lived in Ypsilanti Township. And all of their farms were generalist farms, kind of like the stereotypical farm that you see in children's books. They grew cereal crops. They grew fruit as well. Almost everyone had at least one fruit orchard. They grew a variety of, they raised a variety of livestock, cows, sheep, chickens, and pigs. They also sold wool, raised hay, and a few of the farmers in our area grew some of the less common crops. There was one farmer in Ypsilanti Township who grew and processed sorghum into a sorghum syrup, sweet syrup. There was one person who grew hops and had a hop house in Augusta Township. A person who raised a vineyard Honey was one crop that several local people specialized in, including one of our diarists, and turkeys. And one key point for all of these farms is that their own income was very intimately tied with the groceries in towns, in nearby towns, in Dixboro, in Cherry Hill, which was once a, a more, uh, was once a town, in Ypsilanti, in Ann Arbor. Here's a look at the three Superior Township diarists we're going to discuss today. This is a plat map from 1895 of Superior Township. And you can see near the top, near the, on the northern edge of Superior Township was Phoebe Wilcock, Wheelock's farm. Phoebe Wheelock maintained it by herself after her parents passed away. She inherited that rather large farm and ran it with a hired man. Mamie Vaught was a 12-year-old diarist. She lived on her parents' farm near Cherry Hill. She lived there in a family of four with her younger sister, Abby. William Lambie was a Scottish immigrant who lived near the southern border of Superior Township, just north of Ypsilanti, which is just south of this map. If we think about Phoebe's farm first, you can see that it was just off of Plymouth Ann Arbor Road and Curtis Road going up. 
you can still see the outline of her farm right there. It's currently bisected by Route 14, but it, its outlines still remain, as do many of the other former farms, as you can see if you compare it, it modern terrain to the plat map. She and her hired person were both born in Michigan from parents of New York. And this, this era, the end of the 19th century, is when you see a lot of first generation Michigan farmers. What did her farm produce? These are the ways in which it stood out from the other farms that we're looking at today. She had a large woodland. She grew a lot of oats and wheat and clover seed, a cover crop and also an animal feed, clover. She raised more chickens than the other diarists and harvested a thousand dozen eggs. If you can imagine picking up 12,000 eggs by hand, it's pretty incredible. If you look at her diary from 1889 and pick out all of the food words in it, you can see some of them occur with more frequency than others. The more frequent words in her diary are here, given a larger font size in this word cloud, so as to give you an idea of what were the most frequent words and foods that were of concern to her. You can see that she churned butter very frequently. You can see that she did a lot of baking, okay? an inheritance from British food ways. You can see that a local fruit was important to her. She did a ton of canning in the summertime, a lot of canning of, ch of cherries. And Phoebe was also a pretty adventurous baker. She did a lot of, she tried a lot of different types of baked goods. She made molasses cake, coconut cake, a lot of different types of baked goods. One word we're going to take a look at more closely is this one right here, groceries, because it illustrates how the products of her and other farms were tied into the economy of grocery stores in Ypsilanti and other towns, such as this one. This is a list of goods from one Ypsilanti grocery store. And at first glance, it looks like things you can buy. Actually, it's a list of things that were bought by store owners from the food that you or another farmer might produce on your farm. These are the prevailing prices that would be paid to you when you bring your chickens, eggs, wheat to town to sell. Maple sugar is on the list. Honey, tallow from a butchering is there. All these things had a price, in, a fixed price in town that would be paid to you if you brought that into town. You can see on the bottom it says, for all articles marked in this way, Mr. Shaw will pay the price named at his store, Cross Street, opposite the Follett House, which is here. Follett House is in Depot Town, and opposite it is where Charles Shaw's grocery was, probably in a building that is no longer there. And he was not the only grocer who offered to buy produce. This is another grocer's advertisement from the same year. And he says, I have a willingness to pay the highest price for country produce. And many other things at Arthur Smith's grocer down on Congress Street. Here's another ad from the grocer we saw before, Charles Shaw. And it, I like this ad because it was, it was humorous. This is an ad that appeared at the end of January in 1889, the year we're thinking about. He says, we have no idea that you received a bushel of potatoes for Christmas. Still, potatoes you must have. Doubtless, all your friends neglected to send you much in the line of coffees, teas, sugars, and spices. Probably you failed to get any canned or dried fruits or vegetables for Christmas. And if you were remembered with lots of nuts, cakes, and candies, still, they are all gone now, and you need more. <laughs> so we ask you to consider to come down to our shop and purchase all these things at Charles A. Shaw. And if you're regular customers of ours and have spent the money we recently paid you for your butter or eggs, bring on more, and we will give you more cash. So he's, again, emphasizing 
that he's buying country produce, and butter and eggs is kind of a synecdote or a symbol or a phrase or idiom for all those things that could be brought into town and sold for money, which is what Phoebe did. This is a page from the back part of her diary where she keeps track of all of her accounts for April of 1889, and you can see exactly how she spent her money. Eggs is on April 11th. She brought in 19th and a quarter dozen, and uh, the same day brought in some butter to town as well. It looks like the 11th of April was a big shopping day, actually. She brought in her butter and eggs to town and also purchased quite a few things, including beef, as you can see, and groceries right above it, and other things. So a definite economic exchange going on with the things that she brought to town. You can see that she went shopping again on the 17th of April and again brought in some of her own eggs from the farm. And again on the 21st, a week later. So it was a definite regular source of income for her. That's not the only source of income she had, however. In the same diary page, you can see she's also getting a pretty large payment from a Mr. Crippen. There were several neighbors of hers named Crippen. And I, for the life of me, could not make out whether that was a C or a G Crippen. It looks a lot like a C, but there were no Crippens near her that, whose name started with a C that I could discern at all. So it's, there are some things with these diaries that are, that are really tough to figure out or make clear. But at any rate, this Crippen person paid her $85. We don't quite know what for. It could be renting a pasture. It could be so, the sale of some wood from her wood lot. It could be a piece of, uh, the wholesale piece of land being sold. She had a pretty large farm. She, maybe perhaps she sold some of it. Or it could be the sale of some of her animals. And later in the month, she gets another payment from a different person, Mr. Manley, who was a raiser of stock and cattle in the area. So with that person paying her money, I'm guessing that she was renting, renting a pasture or something like that to him that he could use over the season, which is just, would just have been starting in April. And I was thrilled when I found this in her diary. Saleratus, because there are some people in this audience who know what this is and why it is important. I see some people smiling. What, what is saleratus and why is it important? It's a leavening or baking powder, exactly. It's a, a key leavening in the history of leavening. Let's see if we can take a look at it in this brief timeline. In the history of leavening, we start with a biological agent, yeast, which you can harvest from the air. I've done it. It's really time consuming and unreliable and kind of troublesome and often gets contaminated. It's really not all that great a way to get leavening. So potash was the next solution people found, which is a solution um, from leached water through wood ashes that is evaporated. Also a lye that was also part of soap making, as people probably know. And gave a kind of ashy flavor to baked goods. Wasn't really all that reliable either. So its refined product was pearl ash. And this is where we see it come into the history of American cookbooks in 1796. Amelia Simmons mentions pearl ash as a leavening agent you can use. But it was also not, not very tasty. It had a bitter flavor. It was hard to use. It was, you had to dissolve it first before using it. So a further refinement gave us saleratus, or aerated salt, if we look at the Latin words, a kind of development of pearl ash. And again, we can see it coming in, into American cookbooks with Eliza Leslie, 75 receipts for pastry cakes and sweetmeats. She hyphenates it and offers pearl ash or sal aratus as options you can use during a transitional, this tra transitional period in leavening in her cookbook. Soon baking soda made an appearance, a substance that had to be used with an acid, like sour milk or vinegar, lemon juice. You can still see that in old recipes. Cream of tartar. Cream of tartar was expensive and imported. So finally, 
baking powder came on the seed in the mid-1800s, a, a substance that combines both the alkaline and acid chemicals in one, and is, it's held in a kind of suspension in cornstarch, activated by liquid, so very convenient. It's easy to use. You don't have to wait for the yeast to develop from the air if it does. It's very uh, efficient, and it set off um, what in a fantastic book is called the Baking Powder Wars, a really fervent competition between, people, the, between marketers of this lucrative powder that everyone used because everyone was baking and used this very convenient substance. Here's an example. This is an Ypsilanti paper, small town in the middle of Michigan. And this out-of-state company from New York is putting a pretty large ad in a pretty obscure little paper from in a small town in Michigan, as well as hundreds, perhaps thousands of other papers. It was a very profitable company. Not to be outdone, Dr. Price did the same. This is from just a few weeks later, same paper, Ypsilanti paper, also a, a very rather large prominent ad for a rather tiny product from a very distant company. So there was, there was a lot of money involved in the baking powder wars. And Phoebe's diary shows some of the unique products that she was the only diarist to make, including molasses cake, raisin cake, coconut cake, with that spelling, cocoa nut cake, strawberry shortcake, transparent pie, which is, has a connections to Kentucky cuisine and is somewhat similar to a pecan pie, kind of a sugary pie. She made what she called a frosted cake in the fact that she emphasized frosted is interesting, suggesting that that was an unusual thing for cakes to be, for her at least. She made molasses cookie and what was then a somewhat novel form of baking, coffee cake. The molasses cake, when I read about it, I was really intrigued. And so I looked up a contemporary recipe for it from an 1889 cookbook, the Cloud City Cookbook, one of the many church cookbooks that we have in the history of American cookbooks. And made it, that's a picture of, of what it looked like. It was really delicious, actually. It was really spicy, rich, flavorful. It was, it was quite, quite good. And this is a look at something special that she had. We mentioned earlier that she did a lot of canning of cherries. Cherries was very prominent among the words featured in her diary. But Phoebe had a very unique appliance with which that she did that with, with. It's actually my favorite 19th century kitchen appliance of all time, and that is the gasoline stove. That sounds a little wild because it, it was. It was a strange and dangerous appliance. And she talks about it in the beginning of July, just before the cherry season comes around. She says, and this is, I transcribed it just as she wrote it, help churn, made a transparent pie, and coconut cake had a try, I think the word is try, it's really hard to make out, had a try at cleaning gasoline stove, ironed starched clothes. So presumably she had this gasoline stove somewhere in storage on her farm, it was taking it out in July to get it ready for canning season. After which, in August, she says, made a cake, scrubbed the kitchen floor with a brush, finished tucking white dress, a sewing procedure. Ed, her hired person at the time, took the gasoline stove to AA to be cleaned after using it for canning. Got buggy home from store where it had been to be painted. This is what they look like. The gasoline stove was a cast iron platform with maybe three or four burners, sitting on cast iron legs similar to a treadle sewing machine. And on the side, you can see this pipe going up heading to a coffee can sized vat. And that was what contained your gasoline, which at the beginning of the petroleum refining process had been a waste product. People just tossed away gasoline, had no use for it, but then found that they could be used in this kind of vapor stove, as it was also called. Gasoline stove was quite 
dangerous. And in fact, there were a lot of news stories about explosions of gasoline stoves in Detroit, in Ypsilanti, in Ann Arbor, even. I've read numerous <coughs> stories. And the people reading the original newspapers also read these stories. And I think they knew very well that this was a, quite a dangerous thing to have in your house. So it's an indication to us of how tiresome it was to have a gigantic cast iron stove in one's home in the summer with hours of canning before you and have that, and have that wood-fired stove generating so much in intolerable heat it was so troublesome that people were actually willing to use a dangerous bomb in their house and take that risk in order to avoid the, just the, the heat of canning in July and August. Here's another picture of the gasoline stoves from the Free Press this time. They were two of the many types of stoves made by the several companies in Detroit that produce stoves. All the same similar type of model from two, uh, two different retailers. And another person who did a lot of baking was the family of Mamie Vaught, who lived with her father Philip, mother Mary, and sister Abby. You can see her mother also does a lot of baking. Cake, cookies, Ma or Mamie did a lot of cookie baking herself, churning, apples, cherry pudding, pie, a lot of pie, biscuit, turkey and cherries, and some garden goods. There's a picture of her. She is the person standing. She was 12 years old when she wrote the first of her diaries that we have. That's her younger sister, Abby, whom she writes about quite a bit, her mom and dad. She lived on the eastern side of Superior Township in a small farm whose outline we part of whose outlines we can still see on Ridge Road there, just north of Ann Arbor. And again, um, she's a first generation Michiganian. Her parents were immigrants from New England and their hired man was also from Canada. Their farm was distinguished by these things. It was the most valuable farm of the three we're looking at. They, were, they raised the most so-called Indian corn, paid the most for farm labor, had the most livestock. Indian corn is a type of corn known as flint corn, or very hard corn. It's, it's, a dry corn. It's, a, it, it's a dry corn. It's used for cornmeal, uh, cornstarch. And some of the things that were unique to her diaries are seen here. Ginger snaps, a very old British cookie. It's mentioned in Shakespeare, actually. Cherry pudding. And I had a really hard time trying to figure out how her mother made her cherry pudding, because there are so many different ways of making it. Was it a clafouti, a kind of baked pudding? Very easy to make. You can make it in a cast iron frying pan. Was it a steamed pudding, a type of pudding that takes a very long time? That seemed somewhat less likely, maybe. It was hard to tell. Or was it a boiled pudding in a British sort of style? Again, it takes quite a long time to make that. It was, it was not specified in the diary, so I'm still quite not sure. I would have to guess that in a somewhat Spartan farm kitchen, maybe a clafouti type is the easiest type to make. But I don't know. You never know. She also mentions gooseberries. Pear pickles sounded really intriguing. I read that these are eaten with meat, this red pickle. It sounded really delicious. It does sound really good. And it, it almost suggested a sort of medieval flavor profile, a kind of sweet and sour combination together. She had hash. Her mom raised a number of turkeys for extra income. They also t she also talked a lot about sauce. And that was during the apple harvest season. So I guessed that this was applesauce, maybe, probably. Mamie's diary is also distinctive in that she uses some wild foods. She actually collected nuts for pocket money and she very carefully notes down the amounts of money that she received for various batches of nuts that she collected in the woodlots on her farm. Hickory trees were once um, native to this area. This was an oak, history, oak hickory area, savanna, forest. So there would have been a lot of hickory nuts even in the woodlots on farms. 
She talks about walnuts. She, had, she talks about buying fish hooks in Ypsilanti and going fishing and getting some fish to bring home. And about harvesting berries in the nearby woods as well. Yep. And another diarist, William Lambie, is an immigrant from Scotland. In the 1880s, his household had he and his wife and his five adult children living at home, according to the census, at least. He immigrated when he was 18 years old with his brother and some other family members and bought this farm in the southern part of Superior Township. He raised a number of sheep, he grew oats, and once again, his children were the first generation to be born in Michigan. If we take a look at some of the words that he discussed, you can see a distinct absence of any baking terminology. This was not part of his world whatsoever. You can see that these are all kind of outdoor words, things that he was working with on the farm, particularly apples, which he called his most profitable crop. He grew at least 20 different varieties of apples on his farm. And some other, and cider apples is also mentioned, or the apples that would be <coughs> scooped up at the end of the season made into cider. Some other products he, he produced, uh, he was a very uh, prolific sheep farmer. He had a lot of, he produced 700 pounds of wool in 1880, a lot of apples. He raised bees as well. He <coughs> sold a lot of his wood, wheat, hay, butter, and a lot of sheep as well. Just as a means of comparison, because for these products listed at the, at the beginning, that was, those are the products for which his farm is distinguished or stands out. These are the products that he happened to produce the most of. These are the things that he produced more of compared to the other diarists. Some of the things unique in his writing are, we can guess, connected to his Scottish heritage. He was um, the only person to mention eating mutton as a meat at home pancakes, parsnips, and he bought a pork barrel, salted pork. He mentions pumpkins, a, a, an American food, American crop. He's the only person to mention boiled corn, which I guessed was corn on the cob. Beets and grist and oysters, which is an indication of the development of a, of a cold chain starting to come together. Oysters were packed and were available in Ypsilanti thanks to refrigerated train cars, one of the first such foods available from the East Coast. Radishes, buttermilk, and haggis. <laughs> he was also a writer, and I wanted to kind of take a sidetrack just to mention his book, Life on the Farm, because it's, it's such a charming book. It's a collection of poetry and prose that he self-published in 1883 in Ann Arbor and contains some insights into farm life and culture and food culture. This is a small essay he wrote about apples. And you can see there, even in this tiny excerpt, there are nine different varieties of apples that he just casually tosses off. He raised um, many more than that. He mentions the Baldwin a lot in his diaries over and over again. That seems to be one of his favorite varieties. But it's, it's, one, it's one variety that I'm not familiar with. I wouldn't know what a bald one looks like. We have forgotten a lot of these varieties. The only one I recognized when I first read this is the Northern Spy. For the, the other ones are, are, are weren't familiar at, at when I read that passage in his book. He tried to sell his book with this classified ad in the Detroit Free Press in the fall of 1884. He offered to send it postpaid for 30 cents, about $8. If you had other uses for some spending money, you might opt for Dupree's Oil of Beauty, a surprising complexion beautifier. He wasn't very successful. You can see he's complaining in his diary about the sales of his book. He says the sulky, greedy, 
booksellers of Ann Arbor wanted 30% to sell books. <laughs> and a few weeks later, got all my books from Mr. Beale, the Ann Arbor publisher. It is not easy to write a book or sell them either. <laughs> and at the last, he says, got some money for life on the farm, but my literary venture proves very unprofitable so far. So he was not terribly thrilled with the sales. And I had to pull out a few tidbits from his diaries because I found them very colorful and charming and wanted to share them with you. One of which is in the yellow box, took the bees out of the cellar, bright sunshine, and I was struck by the idea of living an entire winter with a swarm of bees in one cellar. I thought that was interesting. In the purple box, Hall took away a swarm of bees this week to pay for doctoring Frank. I was very intrigued to see a swarm of bees used as an item of barter or currency. It's, he says, an awful cold beginning for the new year. Ice thick in the pale. He used that phrase a number of times in his diaries in the winter, ice thick in the pale. He mentions that over and over again. Mm -hmm. And it made me realize um, the degree of just privation people put up with on a daily basis. On a daily basis. He says in the orange box, Rosie had a calf, had to take it in the house, it being nearly frozen in February. And I was thinking his wife probably really enjoyed that. Mm -hmm. He talks in his red box about a peal of thunder. <coughs> the lightning killed our fine young mm. horse, Bet. We only had one horse that cost $125. And the lightning hit it. And we had our horse insured for lightning, but will not get any insurance because the horse was not killed in the barn. So a loophole, little known loophole of 19th century farm life. On the bottom he says, and I love the timeless quality of this quote in blue, he says, snow over a foot deep after the storm. Frank took Belle and Bob to school in the old long sleigh, and my youngsters were displeased because they thought it too old and shabby. Things but, never exactly, I thought, more things change, the more they stay the same. This is a picture of the Lambie family at their 50th wedding celebration. You can see William Lambie sitting about halfway up the stairs with his wife, Mary, some brothers of his behind and to the side, and the extended family getting together. I love this picture. It's a one, it is a wonderful picture. And in addition to the late 19th century diarists, we also have the diary from 1863 from another farmer, Mary Seaver, who farmed south of, an, of Ypsilanti with her husband, Hiram. She is the lady on the left in this picture with her sister. There's her farm just south of town. Today, it is a little bit north of the Kroger Plaza on Whitaker Road, if you know where that is in general, just south of I-94, south of Ypsilanti. That's a picture of their one-time farmhouse. And a few brief mentions of the things on her farm. 90 acres, not terribly large, not terribly valuable, less valuable than the average farm in her area among her neighbors. She had a little livestock. The main crop they raised was Indian corn, a native grain, native to Michigan, and raised by the indigenous peoples who lived here. And so also some wheat and oats. Wheat and oats are not native to Michigan, nor is barley or rye. These are all immigrant crops, you could say, that came over the Atlantic with the, with the immigrants that grew them. And her diary is interesting in that it, uh, it gives us a glimpse of how the, f the first celebrations of Thanksgiving took place. A holiday instituted by Abraham Lincoln, as you know, by presidential proclamation in 1863, October. Thanksgiving had been celebrated before that, but in a somewhat scattershot way. So this date by this state, different dates in other states. It was not codified in one date as the last Thursday of November, which is what President Lincoln helped um, institute. And you can see it reflected just a few weeks later after that presidential proclamation in Mary Seaver's diary. She writes, knit 
on Hiram Sock today, Twisted Wick for candles, this evening, Hillary called and invited to Thanksgiving, 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 told Mr. Arnold to record the note. I found it very interesting that not only is Thanksgiving not capitalized, it's not spelled correctly, because I think this might have been a word that she only had heard of from somebody, but that had not yet become enough of an institution to be a recognizable, familiar word. It was brand new, only a few weeks old. And I think that might be one reason why she misspells it in her diary. So it seemed to be a very unfamiliar new idea for her. In the same year, we can also see a glimpse of the new Thanksgiving in William Lambie's diary. He kept diary for decades and decades, and we have many of his diaries. In his diary from 1863, he says, Thanksgiving. Mr. Tyndall, his pastor at the Presbyterian Church William Lambie attended, said a good deal about the greatness of America, felt some sad and weary, because his experience as an immigrant was often somewhat disappointing. He was not always, he didn't always feel that the promises of America had been realized in his farm venture. And he often spoke in his diaries about how disappointed he was at some or other misfortune that he had on his farm. It was not easy work, but it, he was less successful than he felt he ought to have been. So he has a somewhat more cynical take on Thanksgiving, which I've personally found very interesting. About 20 some years later, however, we can see that the holiday has now become more institutionalized. Everyone capitalizes it. Everyone spells it correctly in their diaries for as much as that is worth. And now William Lambie is talking about visiting during the holiday. And Phoebe also talks about a particular food that she has, chicken pie, for Thanksgiving, which I found interesting. And Mamie is talking also about both things, about the foods that she's using and about socializing for the holiday. Mom baked buns, I made cookies. Her neighbors, the Gill family, was here and spent the day, we had a turkey. I went to Mrs. Westfall, another neighbor, after dinner, and also went over to Mrs. G, which I think is Mrs. Jeer, at nearly night. So a busy, social, friendly holiday by the 1886 was when she wrote about it. And I found that to be a nice way to sum up or wrap up this topic of finding hints about the food ways of local farms in local diaries. So I would like to end there and take any questions that people might have. This program was recorded on May 20th, 2018 at the Ann Arbor District Library.